Chud is a 1984 American science fiction horror film directed by Douglas Cheek, starring John Hurd, Daniel Stern, Christopher Curry, Kim Greist, with George Martin and John Goodman. Beneath the city of New York are living catacombs, an endless maze of subterranean tunnels, unfit for anything human. Unauthorized for anything experimental. Hold it! There's something moving up ahead at the top! And unlikely to bring anyone down there. So... <laughs> they're coming up. Chud. Chud. Check your basement. And your bathroom. Keep off the street and try to hide. But remember, the dark is their place. The night is their time. And tomorrow, the only things living in the city of New York will be Chud. Chud. Cannibalistic, humanoid, underground dwellers. Chud. They're not staying down there anymore. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm John the Host, and as not always, but always tonight, I'm joined by this guy, my co-host, Mr. Jason Alt. Hey everybody, if you only watch the Cult of Films, you're really missing out, and that means you probably haven't liked and subscribed to this channel, so hey, maybe you should do that. Uh, I'm John's uh, Film Hooligans co-host, and we also... Uh, do another series where we review films. I'm so pleased to be invited back to the Cult of Films here on the They Said We Said YouTube channel. Woo! Yes, uh, indeed. This is a movie that you suggested once again. And, I, I, man, it's been a varying degrees for me. Uh, you, you had some some good surprises. You had We had one that we still disagree on. Uh, but did I like Chud from 1984? We'll get to that, but first off, I want to get to what I'm drinking. I, I feel like this is the chuddiest of beers that I could have picked. This is Hellbent, uh, Hellbent Brewing, rather. This is the Moon Tower Stout. So I got a couple of these going for me. Sir, who, who do you have joining you tonight? I'm stouting it up as well. This is a bourbon barrel stout mm. called uh, Death Star from Revolution Brewing in Chicago. Revolution Brewing, a, a place that does 97 IPAs. So uh, having a competent stout from them was a pleasant surprise. It was a little on the pricey side, but I'm worth it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, drinking out of a Walking Dead Stein, all all the, the nailing it tonight. So Lahayim, sir. Prost. Mm. All right, so let's jump right into it. What did you think of Home Alone Two and a Half: Secret of the Use? Oh, you're you're calling it Home Alone because uh, Christopher Curry, who played Captain <laughs> Bosch in the film, in his film debut, was in Home Alone Three. I see. That must be it. Yeah, <laughs> not John Hurd and Daniel Stern. No, right. definitely Christopher Curry, who <laughs> legitimately was in Home Alone Three. I found that I am on IMDb. <laughs> That's why uh, it's this two is a, and a half. Yeah. This apparently was Christopher Curry's film debut, and it's so fun that he is billed above John Goodman. Because <laughs> this is pre Roseanne John Goodman, where he yeah. was just being a really rapey cop. <laughs> I don't like skinny John Goodman. Can I just go on the record? He wasn't that skinny. Yeah, he had a fluffy shirt on. He's and skinnier did... now. He's skinnier now. Yeah. For sure. And it's freaky. It is freaky. <laughs> um, so what is Chud? Can we just talk about John Goodman for an hour? Because I, I think John Goodman is <laughs> one of the ten greatest American contributions to film. I can see that. How have we not done true stories on Cult of Films? That's Gosh. the next one, Mark it. Th this, is the, uh, this is the ongoing theme. Every, every time we do a, a film, we're like, why aren't we talking about this one? Can we pivot to true stories real fast and just talk about <laughs> David Byrne for an hour? Because, man, I could. Uh... <laughs> I love that movie so much. Uh, what can we add to that, though? Like, that movie yeah. just fucking speaks for itself. It, it really does. It, it gave the band Radiohead its name. Um, yeah. Chud gave a film website its name. That's um, true. So, um, 
Chud is a movie about chuds. Um, chuds are cannibalistic human underground dwellers that were mutated by Chud, which is contaminated hazardous waste urban disposal. Um, so a uh, so toxic waste is being discreetly disposed of illegally under New York City, and there are uh, homeless folks living in the tunnels um, because they have no homes. And uh, they have been coming into contact with and being mutated by this chemical hazardous waste. And it is making them into bloodthirsty monsters because, of course, everybody knows that's what, you know, waste does to you. (laughs) This is in the wake of, like, Three Mile Island and, I don't know, Chernobyl. Like, didn't the river in Cleveland catch fire in 1984? Like. For, this was just really before the United States kind of got its shit together. It's like, what if we actually cleaned stuff up correctly? You had the Toxic Avenger around this time, you know? You had all the great Marvel comic books that we love today. It was all of all of Marvel's stuff was like, I was a normal scientist. And then <laughs> someone didn't dispose of waste the right way. And now I'm Daredevil or, you know? <laughs> yeah. Gamma rays. So this is, this is, I guess, a little bit more realistic than I touch radioactive waste and now I'm a superhero. It's like, now nah, you got the power to not have night vision and, you know, your teeth are sharp now. Uh, so Chud is a movie about uh, a cop whose wife goes missing because she's eaten by a Chud. And he finds that there is a huge nuclear regulatory commission cover up of this illegal waste disposal. And he teams up with a disillusioned photographer played by John Hurd and a, um, a wisecracking uh, soup kitchen running reverend played by uh, Daniel Stern. Yeah, named Harry and, that works the uh, Chicago, you know, suburban streets. He's part of the uh, wet, wet bandits. Well, everybody was wet in this movie, not just the bandits, because <laughs> underground in the sewers in New York, there are mutated turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is actually a parody of Daredevil. Uh, so I thought that was that was another thing that happened in the 80s. That was what, like 88, I think was 88, 89 was the original Ninja Turtles. So like mm-hmm. everybody thought that toxic waste gave you powers, but it turns out it just gave you the power to lay in a hospital bed for a few weeks. Um, so kids don't come into contact with hazardous waste. Uh, you won't get superpowers. Yeah, and this was Cold War esque too, because that that was the big thing was government cover ups back in the eighties, uh, mm-hmm. where it was more you know I think the the more popular idea back then was you know us against them, us against the you know the foreign, but every once in a while you get the uh, you know us against us, and then you know that was the the big ooh you know if you're not safe at home, and that's what I think this movie did so effectively is it takes it it takes your your fears like your the plays on your own fears like who isn't afraid of walking down uh, a, a dingy you know alley in the middle of the night in New York you know a, a, a walking over a manhole you you always have that just like the hackles on the back of your neck kind of raise up and you're just like Ugh, what if this thing gives out or what if something grabs me this was very effective of capturing that very real uh, human fear that that people have um it also stands for contamination hazard urban disposal and <laughs> this movie transcends you know generations because now it's also a, a term for internet right wing trolls so <laughs> i mean this is definitely a cult film um mm-hmm. it has a, quite a quite a big following like i think the the latest homage was the beginning scene to uh jordan peele's us there's like a chud uh, vhs uh in in the beginning of the of the movie so you know mm-hmm. a lot of smart people like this film for reasons um and i think it succeeded in a lot of things it didn't do everything correctly um first off i like i always like to talk about the budget on these uh it had a 1.25 million dollar budget and it made 4.7 mil in the box office so this was actually a financial success mm-hmm. you did it chud you tripled your budget <laughs> and for, see a marvel movie do that for douglas cheek uh who never worked again i mean <laughs> 
He did, but uh, he never directed again. This was a well. You know who done. else never worked again? Parnell Hall and Shepard Abbott, the uh, the story writers. The oh. two writing credits on the film. Um, yep, uh, Daniel Stern and Christopher Curry were uncredited, but I think they probably fixed up the script a little bit. Mm. Maybe because they didn't want this to be a complete turd. Uh, Daniel Stern was very prolific in the eighties and nineties. I don't know if everyone remembers that. He was so good in this. He was so good in this film. Like, I loved every time he was on. I smelled him through the screen, but I loved every time that he was on on screen. And he had great chemistry with, uh, uh, was it, Christopher Curry. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah, he was just, he was good. Daniel Stern was like a natural, he's a natural comedian. He was a Daniel Stern type, you know. Yeah. He just, he played the kind of, the kind of character that he's so good at, he played all, to great effect in the eighties. And like, I've been missing something like that. It's like everyone's trying to be a blank canvas and then completely losing themselves into whatever role they're attempting. Where some people, I think in the eight, even seventies, eighties and nineties were more self-aware of what they were good at. And, and mm -hmm. that that's what they kind of went for more. And I think that was a bit more successful because not everyone's Daniel Day Lewis and wants to completely, you know, disappear into whatever role they're gonna do. Like some people were just better at the at the roles that they were good at. And Daniel Stern, I think, was self aware enough to know that he wasn't Tom Cruise. He wasn't even like a Bruce Willis. He was just very good at this kind of, you know, dirtier character, uh, funny, like he could do slapstick, but he wasn't a Jim Carrey, you know, it was just kind of more believable, but you, he always had like a certain, you know, bit of, of charm and heart to him, even though he's just very kind of a, like a different kind of person looking wise. No, he's, he was fantastic comic relief. And mm -hmm. you go back and you watch something like breaking away or diner or, you know, um, blue thunder. He was good in blue thunder. Roy Schneider um, had it in his contract. He had to play uh, somebody in every kind of vehicle. Hmm. So he's like, I I'm I'm sick of boats. I, I want to do a plane movie. And then the, he did a helicopter movie. And he's like, man, I'm going to go back to boats. And then he did underwater Star Trek. And that is all I know about Roy Schneider's career right, right there. <laughs> John Hurd was good, too. It was good to see him in a more uh, like meaty role. As this, yeah. like, kind of douchey neoliberal, you know, photographer that's just, like, constantly shitting on everything. Um, I kept... I, yeah, oh, oh I, I hate easy gigs where I make a lot of money. <laughs> I feel like a sellout, man. It's like, all right, dude. Yeah. He was just, like, taking... He did all the work, but then was just, like, too much into his own farts that he didn't want to submit the work to get paid. I was like, what the fuck is this guy? Yeah, he put a lot of pressure on his girlfriend, who put up with a lot, and then she got shutted. <laughs> yeah, she le he literally leaves her hanging at a at a at a gig, like a good paying gig, finally, because uh, she puts up with his bullshit constantly of like eating probably ramen noodles with all this like work laying around the house that he's just not getting paid for. He takes off, and then she he comes back like later. She doesn't even give him shit for it. And then she's just like, oh, I'm pregnant. Uh, you want to have this kid? And, like, leaves it up to him if they're having the kid. I'm like, God, this is a 1980s movie for sure. Like, Kim Greist uh, was pretty good in this movie. She looks we... like uh, Glenn Close's stunt double. Well, it's funny you should say that. They considered her for the role in Fatal Attraction, oh, but shit. it ultimately did not go to her. She could have done it, I think. She could have done it, man. Yeah. She had the hair for it. That's really all they cared about back then. <laughs> So some people who are like, where have I seen her before? You might recognize her from Manhunter if you have great taste like me. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. I was going to make a joke that I like Manhunter more than uh, Red Dragon, but like I, I, I pulled back. But hey, I kind of I kind of did, actually. Hey, man, Michael, man, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, but she was on Throw Mama from the Train and Punchline, which is, you know, perhaps where you recognize her from. Can we talk about Punchline one day? I, I would do. I would do an episode on Punchline. It's too real for me. I, I, I know was, how the sausage is made. I was gonna say, just gonna say after those words left my lips that no, you, no Punchline. Punchline's fine. It, yeah. It, John Goodman was in Punchline. We can only do John Goodman movies on this. <laughs> he wasn't in Hudson Hawk. That's why I didn't like it. 
Oh, well, there you go. There, there we go. The things that it did right also, they, they did the alien thing. They did the Jaws thing, where they, they showed the the monster so sparingly. They ramped it up towards the end, and that's fine. But it, it felt like I was watching Alien, the way that they slow rolled. You know, you'd get a, a like a weird-looking mutated finger here, uh, the back of a head here, even a close-up of a face really quick that also invoked that, you know, uh, emotion of, you know, seeing the xenomorph mm -hmm. pop out for the first time against, or, you know, trying to eat Dallas. Um I liked that. They they did that so well. I, hate, I And once you finally saw it, it wasn't a letdown. It was really interesting. Like, there was... Yeah, it wasn't like M. Night Shyamalan signs when you finally <laughs> yeah. saw the chuds. <laughs> right? <laughs> they were just real thick and veiny. Uh, except I fucking hated the, the yellow tennis ball eyes. That killed it for me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, you have this, like, amazing-looking creature where it looks like you just turned someone inside out and, like, shoved, like, steroids up their ass. And that was so cool. And then they just have these weird-looking orbital yellow eyes that look like they were just, like, pasted on. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, who, who let this go out the door? You had it, and then you lost it. Who did let this movie go out the door? The thing, the reason there's so many cult movies, I think, from the 70s and 80s is because I guess they just wanted to try stuff. I, I really don't think they understood what made good sci-fi and horror and stuff like that. So a lot of the times they try and they're like, this could very well be a good horror movie. We don't know. We have committed... 200 million dollars to this movie and it's a piece of shit can it we can't have our name on this it was like yeah a, here's a million bucks go yeah. make a movie for a million bucks and like we made four boss <laughs> we <laughs> so like you could have movies that was just missing a piece to make it really get there but like i don't know what the missing piece is you watch a movie like chud that's you know it's a, a weird cult movie but you watch like good horror made around the same time and you're like, what's the difference? And if you can't figure it out, that's sort of what makes a good cult movie. Because you're like, this should have worked. But maybe the premise was slightly dumb or just the costumes were a little weird. Or just what you... was going on in Cillerary at the time could have affected it too. Yeah. So for whatever reason, Chud is just a movie that like it's it's fun to like ironically i think you know like chud doesn't necessarily work great as a movie but that's kind of what its charm is about so when you have a dumb movie like attack of the killer tomatoes made around the same time that like wasn't taking itself seriously it was just like trying to be another airplane like yeah those are that's a cult movie just because like of how weird it was but like I I tend to prefer the movies that were trying hard to be a good movie and just couldn't get there. Like I don't like snakes on a plane. I like the room, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely in the room category. I, I think it's a little bit more competent than that. I, I it feels like a carpenter movie from back then. I, it's I don't know. Um I, I could see where you're going with it. Because there were just like some things that are just like this happened and this is what kind of held it. Like you could, you could see the glaring things that are just like, this is why this probably didn't take the next step. But I think yeah. it was, uh, you know, it, it was on the same level as like, uh, like the creeps. It seemed kind of like all the junior varsity horror movies from the eighties kind of ended up cult movies. You know, you had like the ghoulies and stuff like that. And like the stuff and killer clowns from outer space, all, all the stuff that wasn't like, Wes Craven or Clive Barker, like real serious horror stuff kind of ended up just branded as this like weird B horror schlock mm -hmm. stuff. Reanimator. Yeah. And, and there was this stuff, you know, that like the, the Gull and Globus stuff that was very obviously like super just like schlocky. You know, this wasn't like Toxic Avenger. This was, you know, a little bit closer to, to something like, nightmare on elm street mm -hmm. but it just it couldn't pull it off so it ended up in this weird limbo between like really silly you know and really competent so i, I think all the movies that kind of ended up in that weird no man's land 
between there were like they didn't have the money to be successful and they didn't have the just the the horror chops to be successful but they also didn't try to make a goofy movie like tremors all the movies that end up in in the middle there they're they all kind of have the same tone so they made a lot of movies like that you know they made a lot of leprechauns Right. movies yeah in the 80s that that kind of stuff well and those made money though it was those those there was a central that was what was huge and that what was pushing horror even nowadays i think you know horrors had such a a growth in kind of transformation over the decades but especially around the the late 80s and early 90s people wanted to focus on one central character they were they were selling the villain and this doesn't have that it has a group of villains. I think this is more akin to like the hills have eyes or something. But like so, some of the scenes, and, and I and I know what you, you're saying. Like, there's just something about it where it's just like it could have been one of those complete classics. And to some people, it is like cult classics. But there's just some things that are holding it back. I think sometimes it kind of forgets what it is. Like, there's three scenes in particular that I'm just like, where what are, what are they doing? What are they going for? Because like there, there's like three shots in here that are straight out of like a Dario Argento Giallo film, and that's like the little girl in the phone booth after Grandpa gets eaten. It has this mm-hmm. fucking fantastic shot of the little girl just sitting, and it's just like, uh, it's like, like a, a Dutch angle of her just yeah. staring. And you yeah. get that you get the shadow from just like the swinging telephone, and I'm like, holy shit! Like that is just like so artsy for this film. The other one is her in the shower. And she pulls up and it like uh, she tries to unplug the the drain and then the blood hits her face. And then there's like a weird freeze pause of her just like with her arm or like with her hands over her eyes. And she's not screaming. She's not moving. It's just this one fucking like five second shot. And I'm like, wait, what (laughs) are we doing an art show for a second? So that's what was like, in my opinion, puts it above like a cut above some things. Because I'm just like a weird like nerd though, but like for other people, I, I can imagine like teenagers watching that in 1984 in the theater, going, "What the fuck was with that scene? She wasn't even screaming. There was blood on her face, you know." Or that scene, it just felt off and felt wrong, which made me like it more. But <laughs> I can yeah. definitely see what you mean. I just I feel like a lot of the uh, a lot of the cult horror kind of has the same tone, and you know I like it so. Um... There's a lot of movies then that came out around around the same time that you would really enjoy if you liked uh, Chud, and if you don't, then like I don't I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Go watch Hellraiser, I guess. Like, there's good, there's good horror made in the '80s. You know, of course there was, but like, it's not as much fun necessarily to like to watch with a group of friends and kind of shit on, you know, it's fun to shit on Chud. They really tried. And like, this is what they came up with. Another thing is the pacing too. And that's something that I will give the film shit for. It's borderline. It it takes a long time to build up for something really to happen. I mean, it starts off strong. Mm -hmm. It starts off with, with some lady and her dog getting pulled in a, in a drain pipe, like right off the bat sets the, that's captain Bosch's wife. Okay. Show some respect. Hey, spoiler alert. That puppy, <laughs> that stuffed dog that's, like, glistening with, with uh, yeah, like, KY and fucking Kool-Aid later on when they find the dog. It's just adorable. Um, I, I LOL'd, and I shouldn't have uh, when I saw that, but Glenn Close, she she kept in character. Like, Some respect for Kim Grice. She was in Brazil, <laughs> for Christ's sake. <laughs> that's true. I did see that. And you didn't even mention that when you were initially... Like... I thought that would be a funny thing to either bust out <laughs> later or for someone to be in the comments like, I can't believe you didn't say she was in Brazil. <laughs> we do I know wanted to about. make someone angry. <laughs> you, you just wound up making me angry. Um, well, yeah. I, I knew I would piss off someone who cared about movies and it turns out i did you so did it you, i did my job fucking madman you did it you're the host man i'm here as the plucky comic relief <laughs> i am the daniel stern to your john hurd here so uh, i'm that schlubby i can't even i can't even be curry huh that's fine uh i don't have the, the, the good enough mustache but if Would you I... like to be the random guy that got pulled into the drain by uh <laughs> can it be john goodman 
I mean, sure, man, but you've already gotten more screen time in this uh, this true. review than he got in the whole movie, yeah. so. And not as memorable. Did uh, did Bosch live? Do you think? Um, I don't think that's important, but okay. that was a pretty big explosion. Yeah, it has a lot of characters. It had a lot of characters to to keep track. It had a of. lot of arcs, and they're like, well, yeah. we got to give every person a ten minute introductory arc before we show a chud. So. And they don't even intersect really? a lot of them until, like, the very, very end. They're just like, help me pull the other main character out of a manhole. And, like, <laughs> oh, that's their first meeting. Is that guy dead? I don't know. Yeah, it was. it's a lot to keep track of. A lot of balls in the air, which it, it makes you... It, it's asking you to care about a lot of people with, mm-hmm. e- with equal, you know, uh, heart, I guess, but... Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I, I would say, you know, I did say like they. There's a lot of alien vibe from this as far as how they slow rolled the character out. Sure. But there's also, and this movie came out before Aliens. But tell me that that scene where Bosch is watching the monitors with his cops down there with the flamethrowers. Fucking James Cameron stole that. Hundred percent. He ripped that that's, off from Chud. That's what. Yeah, man. He was working on Piranha Two at the time, and he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna steal this shit." Hell yeah. He was one of those nobody uh, cult cult horror movie actor or uh, horror movie directors back then. Yeah, I mean, wasn't Piranha Two his first movie, and he only did it because he liked scuba diving? <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Ah, I I like this. I like this a lot. Uh, this is. I I could put this. I I can't yeah. believe. I didn't see this until now. It, it was always one of those where I'm just like, eh, I'll get around to Chud, but it's like I've seen, you know. You you have to make an effort. When I was in high school, all my friends, we would go to Blockbuster because that's how old I am. Um, Blockbuster is a, a, a place before it was a, a Halloween USA. It was a place where they had um, VHS tapes and then very briefly DVDs and then even more briefly uh blu-rays um you could give them money and they would give you a videotape and you would go home and watch it and then you would bring it back to them so you would go to a store twice for one transaction uh, (laughs) which was job pretty awesome yeah so uh we would just get just terrible movies and um i want i would find just lists of like cult movies online because i didn't want to watch true garbage necessarily you know it was it was sometimes fun to watch garbage but like I wanted to see what other people thought was worth watching. So this was this made made a lot of top 100 cult movies of the century lists that came out when I was in high school. And, you know, um, you kind of have to make an effort to like if if someone doesn't tell you to go back and watch Chud, you might not. So I'm telling you now, go back and watch Chud. This spawned two more uh, Chud films in the franchise. Mm -hmm. Don't think I don't know. I, I mean, I never saw Chud, so I, I I miss out, but I, I don't think that we'll be reviewing those on this show. Well, there is a, a movie in post-production called uh, Dwellers that um, gave special thanks to Spencer Abbott, and I just assumed Dwellers was going to be a documentary about people who like Chud, but apparently it's a real feature film. Oh, man. All right, well, stay tuned to that. Maybe we could get a screener on that on our other show. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Pay pay us, Jimmy Johns, and give us a screener for uh, Chud. For, for Dwellers. 2024 or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Do you think this film still holds up? Not as a cult classic, but for someone that... Ha- would you recommend this for someone that's never seen it? Besides someone like me. I would, I would recommend this to people that want to have the kind of experience that I have when I watch Chud. Which is like, this is, it's like a dumb movie that like, it's the kind of bad movie that wasn't, that didn't set out to be a bad movie. It wanted to be a $1.5 million movie that made 5 mil, right? Which you could do on 30 screens making 5 grand a theater for three weeks. Mm -hmm. This debuted at number 13, you know? So like, this was never great, but like... It was a movie people could see on dates, I guess. You know, it was just like a dumb movie. A lot of good shit came out in 1984. This had a lot of competition. The reason I go back and watch it is just because it's it's stupid, man. This is a cult movie that if you if you like cult movies, you will like this. Right. And if you don't like cult movies, what's wrong with you? 
<laughs> what you want to watch good movies all the time like right. who has who has time for that this is fun it, it definitely tested my patience for 25 minutes 30 minutes even if i'm gonna be real honest but once it gets going it sheds along quite well and it's quite enjoyable uh f- fucking uh golf ball eyes aside this movie is cool. And it, it like I said, it, it just has these like little snippets of trying to be like this art house movie, which mm. to me completely works. And I, I don't know. I, I, I love the hell out of this. So um, I think there are just tropes and horror that they, you know, like to follow. Like, you know, there was, there were competent people working on this movie. Mm-hmm. Like none of them ever worked again, but <laughs> <laughs> well, they all just met up on home alone uh, after this. <laughs> I mean, Douglas Cheek's an editor now. Yeah, yeah. He has a total of three, um, three directing credits total. So this was one. That's pretty. That's pretty special. Uh, it's super easy to find too. This was streaming on Amazon Prime, Tubi, <laughs> Pluto. Like they they can't give this film away fast enough. Like to go watch for free, which is great. Like, hey, it made its money back in 1984, mm-hmm. right? Like it's all gravy at this point. Yeah. Yeah, super Every cool. month, Daniel Stern gets a check for 75 cents because <laughs> somebody else watched this. Because I just watched On it. Amazon Prime, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, is, this is a good one, Jason. Your your credit is slowly starting to... Uh... It's not my fault you didn't like Hudson Hawk. It's your <laughs> fault. Uh, I, I, at least I wasn't as upset as uh, Chris from Bad Movie Night was when uh, we talked about Big Trouble. Yeah, because he thought he was going to review Big Trouble in Little China because you guys don't know what a cult film is. <laughs> Welcome back to cult films. We're discussing Duncan Jones' Moon. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. This film. is a goddamn cult movie. Yeah, yeah. This this is every sense of the word. It's a ton of fun. Uh, ah, man. I, I just wish I would have seen it sooner. That was like the whole thing I was I was thinking when I was watching this. I'm like, how did, where have you been all my life, Chud? Um I you know I guess the the current iteration of the right wing trolls on Twitter we, we I see them every day but not a, a true cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller so this is great check it out it's free everywhere and you know what while you're here give us a thumbs up tell us how much you like Chud and don't be a real Chud you know tell us what you really think uh, downstairs in the comments you could follow this uh, podcast. Because I'll be uploading it to all your favorite podcasting sites like iTunes and Spotify and all that. Leave us ratings there. You could follow us on Twitter at uh, The Cult of Films, all under case. Or you could follow me personally at John the Host on Twitter. Jason, my special guest on The Cult of Films this week, where can everyone find you? I am at Jason E. Alt on the bird site, and I have a pinned tweet at the top of my page that tells you all the other projects I work on are on the internet. Excellent. And thank you all so much for watching tonight and cheers.